Good evening, everyone. I'm glad you could be with us here at Victory Baptist Church for the evening service. I hope everybody enjoyed the service this morning. We had our second drive-in service and went well. What a great blessing to see everyone here. And so as we meet tonight, I want you to grab your Bibles and turn with me in two places. Two places we're going to bounce back and forth. I have four things I want to give you tonight that I think will be a great blessing to you. I want to talk to you on this thought, in the heat of the battle, in the heat of the battle. So would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and then also look at Ephesians chapter 6, in Ephesians chapter 6. And so we think about uh, in the heat of the battle, we're looking at the, uh, the life of David against Goliath, and then we look about the armor of God that God has us to put on in Ephesians. And so before we begin reading our scriptures, and we'll pray in just a minute, let me just make it a couple announcements to you. Ladies, remember the Bible studies that are, that are continuing going on. You have any questions about that, please talk to Miss Kim Welch and, or call the office and we can get you some help with that. And um, so also, right as, this, right as the governor releases our, um, our shutdown, in services can go back to, to, we haven't, but let's just carve out this time to really get alone with God. And we're just going to have a great meeting here at the church, we'll have some great singing, great preaching. And the lineup we've already got pretty well set and just praying about that, looking for God to do something wonderful and great in an extension of all this that we've been, we've been going through. So I hope that you'll begin praying about this meeting. So let's look at our scriptures tonight and I just think about in the heat of the battle. I think about this year, in 2020 alone, there has been a lot, many times, more times out of, out of none, that our flags have been half staff. You know, but most of the time they're, they're, we raise them on top, but if someone dies on the battlefield or in recognition of someone, they fly half staff. So in the last while, right now they're not, but the last while they have been lowered quite a bit. And it's because ones have died in battles and what have you. And then on the front lines, we have men and women that are dying on the battlefield. Also, we have men and women right now on a different type of battlefield. And this battlefield is for medical reasons of the coronavirus and what have you. And I thank Miss Beth Neese for sending me some emails and sharing with me some people that are on the front lines of all this that's taking place. And we pray for them and we encourage you to do the same And as they are away from their families during this time and, and what have you. I think about the storms that have been going on and many have lost their homes during this shutdown time. So now where do they go? And they've lost their homes during tornadoes and different things that's taken place. Fires have occurred in some homes and they've lost their homes. And so many are suffering during this time. And I thank God for those that are on the front line, such as our police officers, our firefighters, our, our, our doctors and um, uh, nurses and paramedics and all those. And what a blessing they are. And now we're going to a different battlefield. We're going to a battlefield, not only just a fight, in a physical battle that David fights against Goliath, but we're looking at your individual battle. As a born-again believer, you and I are in a battle every day of our lives. And listen to me, we have one common enemy, and the enemy is the enemy of God, and it's Satan, Lucifer, and the fallen angels. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll begin in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Father, we do thank you for the many blessings of life. We thank you for this privilege that we can come on a way of social media, Lord, to reach people for the glory of God. Now, Lord, we ask that you speak to our hearts in a wonderful way, that you be honored and glorified in all that's said and done. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I think about being in the heat of the battle. And in the heat of the battle, I believe there's four things that we need to identify that you can identify in 1 Samuel chapter 17, but also identify for you and I, in Ephesians chapter 6, where God is telling us through the Apostle Paul to put on the whole armor of God. Now let's begin in 1 Samuel and let's read in 1 Samuel chapter 17 from verse 1 to verse 14. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shokah, which belonged to Judah and pitched between Shokah and Ezekah and I can't pronounce the last name, but look at the, the last one. Look at verse 2. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah. 
and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. Now, just think about the battle as it's beginning to set stage. The Philistines against the children of Israel. One is on this mountain, and the other one is on this mountain. And there's a valley in between them. But the battle is already being set, ready to fight. And the Bible says in verse 4, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines. So now, Goliath has gained a title over his life. He started just like any other boy. He grew up and learned the military and began to train and what have you and become one of the greatest warriors that the Philistines had ever seen in their days. And so he was a great warrior. And none in the Philistine army could defeat him. He has defeated many. And so he has, he has risen to, to be champion over the Philistine army. And so much so that even the children of Israel was so afraid of him. Now, notice just the, the height and the stature of Goliath. L look at his armor just alone. So look at verse 4. It tells about his, his height. And there were, was a champion about of the, uh, out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. My wife and I were figuring that up for you tonight. Uh, tonight. And it's nine feet, three inches tall. Now notice what he's wearing for his armor that he's putting on for the fight. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs. And a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. So now we've got one man that is armed with all this, uh, this covering. He's got all this equipment on. He's got a spear in his hand and a sword. And now we find that someone else is carrying his shield for him. Now, you know the story about David. David didn't have that kind of armor, nor was David of that size of stature. David was just the youngest of Jesse's children, and three of his older boys, we'll read about in just a minute, follow Saul into battle, but yet David is the one God would use to come against Goliath. And we must identify, number one, you must identify the enemy. You must identify the enemy. Who is the enemy? Well, the enemy here is no doubt uh, Goliath of Gath, the champion of the Philistines. His height, his stature, man, what an awesome size of a gentleman he would have been. We wouldn't, we wouldn't consider him a gentleman, being a Philistine army, but yet we'd see just his stature and his size. It would be someone that would cause other people to fear from, from going against. We think about ones in, in wrestling matches and boxing matches and MAA matches and different things of that sort. And as they go to fight, one may be smaller than the other. But listen to me, don't take light of the smaller man. And we find that God is going to use David in a glorious way to defeat Goliath. But we see the size of this guy. Now notice, if you would, in verse 8. The Bible says, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said to them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. Now listen, there is a great challenge set and forth right here. That if the Philistine army wins, that Goliath wins against one man that he fights against Israel, then Israel becomes servants to the Philistines. Now vice versa, if Israel wins by the one man fighting against Goliath, then they become servants to Israel. Now notice in verse 11, the Bible says, When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now it's interesting why the children of Israel 
would have been afraid during this battle. Well, naturally, you and I get afraid during some battles because our focus is more on the battle. Our focus is more on people than our focus on God. Now, if you'll notice, the Goliath calls out the children of Israel and say, you follow, you're, you're really a servant, or you follow Saul. And you know, when David comes on the scene, David gives a total different picture of who's in control of the Israeli army. And so now we find that uh, Eliam, uh, Abinadab, and Shema, which is David's brothers, go off to battle. And so now we've identified who the enemy is here for the children of Israel. It's the Philistines, number one. Their champion, Goliath, as is calling them out. He's setting the challenge for the battle. Now I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, please, to Ephesians chapter 6. And look at verse 12. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. And I want you to notice who our enemy is. We must identify the enemy. If we don't identify the enemy, we are going to be wounding the wrong people. If our people didn't know what kind of helicopters and planes and be trained to listen for those and spot those in the air, it's possible that our own people could shoot down our own. And so they're well trained and well equipped to be focused on the enemy that, that's attacking them or they're out to attack. And I think that if we're not careful, we may miss the signs of who our true enemy is. Now Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians that in verse 12 of chapter 6, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now I think there's many times that brothers and sisters wrestle and fight against one another, but my friend, we're not to fight against each other. That's not where the battle is. Um, we are to love one another, encourage one another, help one another, uh, help each other grow in the faith and growing close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our enemy is none other than Lucifer that fell from heaven that wanted to be higher than God. Listen to me, and, and, and Lucifer was nothing more than a created being. So in this battle, in the heat of the battle, your enemy today is not your brother. It's not your neighbor. It's not your friend. It's not your co-worker. But yet the devil can use people like that to cause some reactions, to cause some bitterness, to cause some anger to come against one another. And you realize a lot of that division that comes is to keep you from sharing the gospel and being a great witness to those that are around you. Listen to me. God has placed you where you are for a purpose, and that reason is to share the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the devil knows that more than we do. He knows more about the ones that come in, in contact with us, and he can cause a little strife between us, then he can keep the gospel from being shared. And my friend, just understand, our common enemy today is none other than Lucifer, the devil, Beelzebub, uh, the fallen angels, the demons that we read about in Scripture. That's enemies against our God, against our Savior, against the Lord Jesus Christ, the true and living God. We have one common enemy, and it's not our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not even the lost world, because the lost world is who we want to reach for the glory of God. We must identify the enemy. Notice number two, if you will, and go back to, to the story of, of David and Goliath and 1 Samuel. And I want you to notice this. You must identify the cause. What is the cause for the fight? What's the cause to be in the heat of the battle? Now, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 15, but David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself. And I want you to notice this is morning and night for 40 days. Now that's, I'd say, 40 long days as the children of Israel are hearing this. Now we got 40 days that the Philistines are on one side of the mountain, Israel's on the other side of the mountain, the valley in between 
And he comes out and defies the children of Israel every day for 40 days, calling them out, send someone to fight with us. And I want to just share with you right off the bat is that it's showing right here, before we go any further, that Israel is truly not trusting in the God of heaven at this time. Their eyes are on the enemy. Their eyes are on the battle. Their eyes are not on the Lord. You know, I think about Peter when Peter stepped out of that water. And, you know, we could criticize Peter for sinking, but you know that he is the only one that stepped out of the boat even to attempt to walk to Jesus. And he did so until he took his eyes off the Lord and he began to sink in the water. And then he cried to the Lord for help. Listen to me, my friend. It's easy for us to take our eyes off the Lord in the heat of the battle. And I'm encouraging you today to turn your eyes upon Jesus in whatever storm you're facing, your eyes need to be on the Lord. And then we can be victors during this battle. And so David, he is sent by his father to go check on the brothers and he carries them uh, these 10 cheeses under the captains and thousands and to look how the his brother his brothers are faring during this time. And David rose up early in the morning and he left the sheep with a keeper. He was taking care of his father's sheep and he leaves them with a keeper. And so he goes off just like his dad had asked him to, to check on his brothers. And he gets there to the battle. And we find in verse 22, the Bible says this, and David left his carriage in the hand of the, the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath. Now, I'd say David hasn't been there that long. And now, all of a sudden, just like normal, we find Goliath steps out and begins to call out like he has day in, uh, day out for the last couple days and, and defying the children of Israel and really just making fun of them and hoping someone will take him up on the challenge. Now, if you'll look over, if you will, please, in verse, uh, verse 20, 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him. What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the... And I want you to catch this. It's not the armies of Saul. It's not the armies of Israel but the armies of the living God. It took a little boy, probably, I, I, I would call him a little boy. He was probably about 17 years old, maybe 15 years old. I really don't know exact age that David had been at the time. But it took this young boy to bring back to light to the children of Israel, you are the, the army of the living God. He is saying, my God, our God is alive. And, and who is this guy that would defy our God? Now, in verse 28, and Eliab, his eldest brother, heard, heard David when he is speaking. And he says, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and, and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You've just come down here just to witness what's going on, David. What are you really here for? And David says this, What have I done? What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Probably one of the greatest sayings of David's life. Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason to fight? Is there not a reason to press forward? Is there not a reason for the battle? You must identify the cause. Look down at verse 31 of 32. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistines. And I, I could just hear the children of Israel, this young boy saying, I'll go down Saul and fight against this Philistine. And I can just hear him chuckling around, who does he think he is? Saul is a great military uh, a man and has killed many and he is the greatest one of our military and he's afraid of Goliath. Who who makes this boy think he can, he can do it? Now the Bible says this, in an unusual situation, in verse 34, and David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. 
And when he arose against me, I caught him by his, by his beard and smote, and smote him and slew him. And the servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this, the, this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he had defied the armies. Again, notice what he says, of the living God. David's focus is not on Goliath. His focus is not on, on Saul. His focus in his mind is on God. And he shares with Saul. He says, Saul, listen, I, I might not be the biggest guy in this military, but I'm depending on God. And I believe something strikes in the heart of Saul that brings real conviction to him that he realizes he has neglected the presence of God in his life and he, he knows he's not fit for the battle. And something God puts in Saul's heart to say, okay, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you go above all the other men in my military army and I'm going to let you fight against this Philistine because you're trusting in the true and living God. And the Bible says in verse 37, David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Now notice the word Lord. It is capital letter. So he's talking about Jehovah God. And I believe Saul recognizes here God's hand and God's presence is upon this boy. And really, there was nothing else Saul could do. And he lets David go into battle. Now, we're, we're identifying the cause. David says to his brother, is there not a cause? There's not a reason to fight as he's defying the true and living God, the children of Israel? Now, notice what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And look at verse 10, 11, and 13. Ephesians chapter 6. The Bible says, finally, my brethren, be strong in, what does it say? In the Lord, in Jehovah God, and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, I'm going to be honest with you tonight that every battle I face, I don't always stand this way. I, I wish that I, I, I would. And when we come to the end of this message, we're going to be a challenge you in this same area. Is what about your battles? Is some battles you're stronger in than others? Or as most battles, you're relying on God from the very beginning because we should be, in all honesty. The lost and dying world should see our faith and our trust in our God just as David had that trust in the true and living God that God would deliver him through all this that was about to occur. David didn't, he didn't match up to Goliath. David's weapons didn't even match up to Goliath. But he knew by the hand of God. He says there in that story, he says, I know God is going to deliver the, the Philistine champion into my hand. We're going to win this battle. And so we find there's a battle you and I face. It's not my armor that I put on, it's God's. I can't fight against the devil in my own. I can't be strong in my own strength, and so often we try. But the Bible says be strong in the Lord. And the Bible also says put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand. So not having the armor of God on is just the opposite. You and I can't stand. Not having the armor of God on, we're going to be defeated. Not having the armor of God on, we're not going to be victors. We're not going to be on the winning side of that battle. Now, if you are a born-again believer, you are already on the winning side. But there's little battles we face in life, is what I'm describing today. And those battles are ones that even believers fail in. I don't believe there's anything of a failure unless someone just fails to not ever get back up. But if you fall in a battle and you get back up and keep going on, you're not a failure because you're asking God to help you as you learn from those mistakes and you triumph through the next battles that come. 
Listen to me, every battle you face, whether it's cancer, whether it's financial, whether it's marital, whether it's spiritual, whatever it is, all the battles you face in life, we must trust in God to help us through it. Because the devil throws all kinds of darts at us to hinder us from our walk with God. So we've looked now, at, you must identify the enemy. You must identify the, the cause. Why are we fighting? What is the fight over? Our fight is against the common enemy. It's against the devil. The attacks against God. He is defying the God of heaven still today as he was in the story with David and Goliath. And we must stand. Is there not a cause to fight? You know, there's some things in life worth fighting for. There are some things worth dying for. But then there's some battles worth just letting go. And we must trust in God and seek God's face in every battle. Would you notice number three? You must identify the weapon. You must identify the weapon. So interesting, we read about the, the weaponry and the, the armor that Goliath wore. But notice what David has in his military battle, in his armor. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. You remember when Saul tries to dress him in that military armor? He says in verse 38, And Saul armed David with his armor. That's with his own armor. He, Saul takes his armor and puts it on David. And, and you know the size doesn't work. It doesn't fit. To find another man in the military that would fit David just wouldn't work. So he tries to protect David with the best of the best that Israel had to offer. And that was Saul's armor. And he put, it, put a helmet of brass up on his head. Also, he armed, armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor. And he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these. Now, he says something so interesting to, Dave, uh, to, to Saul. Look at verse, uh, in verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of, out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. But he told, he told Saul, these things have not been proved yet. Now, what did he mean by that? He's got Saul's armor on. He says, Saul, I can't wear this. He begins to take the helmet off, take the coat off, the mail off, take everything off, lay the sword down. He says, Saul, this has not been proven yet. I, I can see Saul's face and says, listen to me, young man. I have fought many battles with this. This sword has killed many people. This mail has protected, this helmet has protected me from dying in many fights and in many wars and you say it is not proven? What do you mean? And what he's saying is, is, this is not what God's given me. This is not the way God wants me to fight this battle. God wants me to go just as I am, as he uses me. I'm trusting in the true and living God. He takes all that off. He grabs his sling. He grabs five stones. And he begins to head off to battle. Now probably... He is the laughing stock not only of the Philistines, but also uh, of the Israeli army. Not only are they laughing, but they're afraid in this battle. So what are you doing? You're going to let him go to fight? You know the challenge in this, Saul? That if we lose this battle, if this boy loses this battle, there's a lot riding on this. We're going to become servants to the Philistines. We can't let that happen. And Saul, I believe he'd have to calm his army down and says, listen, guys. I believe God is in this. And we find David heads off to battle. The Bible says in verse 44, And the Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. You must identify the weapon. Let's identify for just a minute Goliath's weapons. He's got a spear. He's also got a sword because David uses his own sword to cut his head off. Now, what was the weaponry that David had? Well, he at first had a sword and he had all the garments that would match similar to what Goliath was wearing. And now he's taken all those off and just a shepherd boy with a staff 
and with a sling in his hand with five little stones. That's his weapons. But the greatest weapon is unseen. The greatest weapon in his arsonry is none other than the living God he was talking about when he first stepped in to, to greet the military army and his brothers there. And he heard Goliath speak. Now I want to ask you today, what is our, what is our weapons? Now we must identify them. Now one, you'll call out. And you call it the sword, the word of God. That is, that is true, and that's what the Bible says. But I believe we've missed a certain weapon that we can read about in Ephesians chapter 6. And I want you to look at that with me, please. In Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse 17. Verse 17 starts another sentence. And let's don't stop until we finish off that sentence. So it goes 17, 18, and on down. So let's see the weaponry that you and I have in amongst the battle we're facing. Now remember, we're not, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, and against, uh, against people and individuals in this life. Our real battle is against principalities and powers and, and so on that we find in verse 12. Our enemy is the devil and the fallen angels. So what do we use as a weapon? Now look at verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Now, you and I don't carry a sword, do we? Not a literal sword. Some, some people today carry around a, a gun on their side or a knife in their pocket. But, but that's not the weapon. That weapon can't help in something we can't see. Do you realize we're facing an army in a battle that you and I can't see physically? All we see is what we face in our natural life, physically. But there's a spiritual war that's going on day in and day out. And so what is the weapon that we use? What's the weapon of choice? Well, the Word of God probably in natural man would not be your weapon of choice. Your natural thought would be a gun, a knife, or something of that sort, sort to where we can see and feel and put our hands on it. But listen to me. The greatest weapon we have is one of two things. One is the word of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Listen to me, my friend. This word, this Bible is powerful. The Bible tells us we must hide the words of God in our heart that we might not sin against God. When Jesus was led up in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, we notice he uses scripture. He used the word of God to fight the devil. Now, there's something else that Jesus did in his life besides of quoting Scripture. What was the other weapon? Look at it in verse 18. The first word, praying. Not only is the Word of God a weapon, but our prayer life is a weapon as well. Listen to me. If you just read the Word of God without any prayer and without seeking guidance from the Lord, we're missing out. Prayer is talking to God, one-on-one -on -one fellowship with God, the communication we have with God. So in all reality, we have two weapons. One is the Word of God, and the second is our prayer life and staying connected with God, just like David did. But we take the Word of God as God speaks to our heart and we communicate with God through prayer. We take the Word of God and fight with the sword of the Spirit. And the Bible tells us that it pierces even to the dividing as under. It's almost like a double-edged sword as it cuts going and coming on both sides and it pierces deep inside. And it's the Word of God that brings conviction to man's heart and life. You realize that you didn't get saved apart from the Word of God and you didn't get saved apart from people praying for you. It took that individual praying and seeking God's face and guidance and God leading them to share the gospel with you. It, it took the Word of God and the Spirit of God to take the Word of God into your heart and you trusted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior because you saw how wicked you were and how holy God is and you turned to a holy God, that true and living God that David is talking about. The Bible says in verse 18, prayed always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, 
that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul is saying it, it takes the, the armor of God, it takes the sword of the Spirit, and it takes my prayer life in connection with God to be able to speak, to speak boldly and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world and to stand in this fight against the enemy. So you must identify the enemy. You must identify the cause and you must identify the weapon. Now lastly, we must identify the victor. You must identify the victor. Go back and let's look at the closing part of, of Goliath and David's battle as we know who the winner is. It's not Goliath. He does die in the battle. But look at what the Bible says in verse um, 37 of chapter, uh, chapter 17. And the Bible says, And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion <clears throat> and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Right there, David is already identifying Saul. I am not the winner. I am not the victor. God is. The Lord God is. He is the winner of this battle. He is the one going to deliver him into our hands. It is by God's hand, Saul, that we will defeat Goliath. Now look, if you will, verse 45 to 47. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. And it's almost as David is making fun of Goliath now. Now he's never had anyone in these 40 days do this till now. And this little boy is coming to him to fight with just a slingshot, we'd say. And yet he is now calling him out. And he says, But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. And I will smite thee and, and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. David saying, God is the winner, Goliath. I'm going to defeat you by the true and living God. Verse 47, And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, I would wonder what his thoughts were at this time. I wonder if Goliath would begin to laugh a little bit at David and, and think, well, there is no way this boy is going to... Do. Or could it be that some lump in his throat come because God had placed something there that this boy is for real. This boy really thinks he's going to win this battle. And Goliath is really getting ready to fight. And I don't believe that Goliath is really nervous about the fight. I think he feels comfortable about winning but on the other hand, I think David does too. I think God put such a peace and calm in David's heart that he knew the battle was already won before he entered. Just the presence of God is there. And we find David would take that sling, take one stone, and it plant right between the eyes of that, of that giant, and he fell dead. And David runs up, takes his, the sword out of Goliath's sheath, and cuts off his head. And the, the battle is won. And it's not because of David. It's not because of Saul. It's not because of the army of Israel. But because of the God of heaven. And David gives credit to God in those verses. And really from the beginning of the time, he steps at the edge of the battlefield. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 6 and let me close with this. Now what about our, our victor? Listen, we face many battles in life. But any battle you win, you are not the victor. We like to think we are at times, but we're not. We are on the winning side if we've been, a, we've been born again and saved by the glorious grace of God. We know the end of the story. We'll be in the presence of the Lord forever. But you might be saying, well, Pastor, what about 
all the battles we face in life. I want to win those battles. I, I want to defeat the enemy in all these battles we face. I don't want fear to overtake me. And I'm glad you're thinking that way because these verses is what we need to help us. Just like David, we can win the battle. And, it, and we don't have to fall in these little battles that we do fall in. I believe we can stand triumphantly in every battle that we face. Now, let's look in closing. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 11, 13, and 17. Now, you put on the whole armor of God. You've got this armor you put on. Now, look at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Now, if you don't put on the whole armor of God, you're already defeating yourself. You have to have the whole armor on. And then he says this, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles means many darts that are thrown. You mean to tell me tonight that we can win over the battles in life? I'm telling you, yes, we can. God tells us this in the scriptures and under the writings of Paul to the church at Ephesus. Look at verse 13. Wherewith take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Yes, we can stand firm, we can stand triumphantly, not in our own strength, not in our own power, not in our own might, but we can stand by the grace of God in these battles we face in life. You do not have to lose in the battle. God is the victor. God is the winner. And we're on the winning side with God on our side. But you must put on the whole armor of God. Now look at verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword. Now, if he only said sword in being the word of God, we would miss out on something. The sword of the Spirit. How do we know the scriptures to use when we're fighting against the devil? We hide the word of God in our heart. But how do we know what verses to quote during a time that we're being attacked by the devil? Well, the, the Spirit of God shows us what to use. And the sad thing is, is that many of you have been saved for a long period of time. But how many scriptures do you have in your arsonry? How, how many of you do you really have set in your mind that you memorize, that you can use to fight against the wiles of the devil. And we need to be able to use different scripture to attack in different areas where he is attacking us. Listen, God has given us the word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's not our words. It's not our strength. It's not our might. But it's by the glory of God. Amen. What a wonderful truth we find through, through the life and, and battle of Saul and Goli uh, David and Goliath, but also through the armor that you and I can put on. In the heat of the battle, you can stand. Now, let me close with this. We all face many battles in life. Many battles in life. I've heard this saying uh, um, a lot in my life. We're either going into a storm, or we're in a storm, or we're coming out of a storm. And how true that is. And right now, we're seeing... We're in the storm, but we can see light at the end of the tunnel of coming out of this for this period of time, but we know other storms will arise of this fashion. But it makes me think about every battle we face in life because we consider every storm as a battle. And I, I don't really think that's the case. Our real battle is with one common enemy, and it's the same enemy that was against God in the beginning where Satan rose up after God created him to, to, to be higher and wanted to be better than God. And he's a created being. It's, it's absurd to even think so. And so Lucifer, that fallen angel, now is the one that tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, and she took that fruit, and she began to question the things of God. He, he works his devices to stir up strife and contention and between God's people and between God's people and the lost world to keep us from witnessing, but keep us from growing and, and causes us to be attracted to other things to keep us from getting in the word of God. And is there anything in your life right now that comes before you, that is before you, that comes before God's word and your relationship with God? Listen to me. We need to put that to the side and we need to get back to where 
God is the main focus of our life. We can so easily be like the children of Israel and be like Saul, but we need a heart like David. It's the true and living God we're serving, we're fighting for. We can't fight this battle alone, and can I tell you something? God never asked you to. He always said He'd be with us. He has actually expressed that He's going into the battle with us. He'll watch over us. He'll take care of us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. These battles should help us to rely on the Lord even more. But so often, they bring great offense when we face these battles. These battles that David faced and we're facing today of spiritual battles and other battles are battles we face to rely on God to help us through where we should be growing during these times. But often we cry a poor, poor, pitiful me type of cry. And we become very negative than being positive and focusing on what God can do. Can I be honest with you? We're more like Saul and the children of Israel during the battle against Goliath than we are like David. But I think that we can turn the tide of that. And I believe we should be like David when we go into every battle and every struggle we face and every storm and every crisis where we know that God is the victor and we're going to rely on God through thick and through thin. We can easily identify that a Lucifer is out to destroy us. But sadly, we fail in standing triumphantly from the beginning, claiming our victory in the Lord Jesus. So let me close with three questions. And number one is, so are you usually weak or strong in these battles? Are you weak or usually strong like David in these battles? Do you usually complain or trust God in these battles? Might we identify one other thing? That not relying on God in these battles is nothing more than S-I-N. It's sin. And can I tell you something? I have to confess this myself. I don't always stand triumphantly in the storms. But I'll tell you, God wants us to. And God has promised in the Word of God that we can. But to do that, we've got to rely on on yeah listen to me this is not the end of this storm there'll be other storms that will come might come an end to this one maybe to say but another one will arise how will you stand in the storm how are you standing right now in the storm are you trusting in god like david did in the true and living god standing on the winning side or have you crumbled in amongst the storm my friend I hope you'll find again a place in your house to fall upon your face upon uh, before a holy God, asking God to speak to your heart like never before and surrender your life to Him. Tonight, you may not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to invite you tonight to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Repent of your sins and turn to Christ for salvation. He's the only one that can forgive us of our sins. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. You might as well get thee behind me, Satan. You cannot prevail because Jesus never fails. Sometimes this world brings trouble I find so hard to bear I know I could not make it Without Jesus being there It's so encouraging to know However deep we're in despair That my Jesus never fails So what can I do? To prove to you, tell me how can you deny? No untold facts, no mysteries, it's all so cut and dry. On the witness stand of your life, I'll be the first to testify. Jesus never fails. Jesus never
might as well get thee behind me, Satan. You cannot prevail because Jesus never fails. You might as well get thee behind me, Satan. You cannot prevail because.